1925. First, let me explain these thermodynamic concepts. S is entropy. That's the measure of randomness. It's the most popular kind of pop science uh, way to explain it. Uh, it's really, another way to say it is the unavailability to do work. Because the more random you are, the less work you can do. So how unavailable something is to do work. And its major contributor is something called the number of microstates, or the number of possible ways that something can be arranged, which I'll talk about in class. The other one, delta G, this is a kind of an overall energy. Uh, and maybe you could say it's the kind of the opposite of entropy a little bit. It's the maximum amount of work possible in a closed reversible system. So the maximum amount of work possible is delta G, and specifically in a closed system that is reversible. So it's a state function because it's reversible. Uh, it's a closed system. So, if you want to write delta G, if you remember any of this stuff before, it's really you remember the internal energy, that's the overall energy possible. It's when you subtract off work and subtract off temperature times the entropy, uh, that's the leftover energy, and we call that energy the free energy. And so delta G is the Gibbs free energy. The free energy available to do work is really what it is. Okay? That's kind of what it is. It's different than you. It's not as all-encompassing. But it turns out to be a helpful thermodynamic function. Come, it pops up, surprisingly, a lot of equations that are derived. So we find it quite helpful. Uh, anyways, that's the conceptual thing. A maximum amount of available work. Okay. So, in this question, we want to find delta G. The delta G formula looks like this. It's delta H minus T times delta S. So delta G equals delta H. That's the enthalpy, which is what? What's enthalpy? That's way back chapter 7. It's heat at constant pressure. Heat at constant pressure. Minus T, that's just temperature. And delta S, that's again the uh, unavailable amount of work <laughs> or the amount of randomness in the system. So, I know they're kind of meaningless thermodynamic values for you, but uh, the way this uh, course is set up, you start off with thermo and you end with thermo, uh, and you'll see why that's true if you take 2C, but it's a slightly meaningless in 2B why we do this. Whatever. So, we want to find delta G. You have delta H, it's given. The temperature, I think the temperature is actually given in this problem. It's 298. The temperature here, this happens at 298 Kelvin. So you have temperature. The only thing you don't have is delta S. And so this is, if you can remember back when we did delta H of formation, it's a way of finding delta H. There's two ways. One is Hess's law, one is delta H of formation. This is going to be a very common problem in this chapter, so you want to re-remember that if you forgot it. And what it basically is, is the products minus the reactants. These are all formation values for S, entropy, and we can use those formation values to find delta S, which again is the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. So what you do is go to products, that's P-O-C-L-3, that you go two times that numerical value under there, 222.4. That's joules per Kelvin. That's the sum of all the products. There's no other product. You subtract that off. And I'll put a big bracket to start our reactants because there's more than one. 2 times 311.8 joules per Kelvin plus. So that's for the PCL3, the phosphorus trichloride. And then for the oxygen, uh, 2 times 205.1. If this was an H of formation, what would this value be? Way back, chapter 7. Zero. Zero. Yeah, why is that true? You're absolutely right. 
It's an elemental particle. It's elemental. It's, this is the elemental. But for entropy, stuff is not going to have a zero entropy. <laughs> There's always a positive non-zero value for entropy. And so everything will have a value for it. Yeah. Why did you multiply the 2 of 5 by 1 by 2? Oh, yeah. This is a 1, right? Yeah. That's my mistake. It should be a 1 here. Thanks. Because this should be, if I balanced it right, this should be a 1. Good. Thanks. Okay, this turns out to be minus 383.7 joules per Kelvin. Now what did I just tell you about entropy? It's going to be a positive non-zero number. So what this means is the forward reaction is not spontaneous. Meaning entropy favors the reverse reaction because it's negative. Entropy hates negative action. That means it's getting more ordered. And entropy tends towards disorder. But anyways, you can calculate a change in entropy that is negative. It just means that reaction is not spontaneous. And now, you have all the values to find delta G. So delta G, using this equation, is delta H, which is minus 620.6, Joules minus uh, T delta S, T is 298, and delta S is minus 383.7 joules per Kelvin. Okay. There's going to be an issue when I do this calculation. Anybody see it? You have to multiply the, you have to have them both in the same. You've got to have the same units. This is joules. Entropy is almost always going to be in joules. Delta H is almost always going to be in kilojoules. So you always have to do that conversion. So I basically, this front number, I have to change to joules, which is just multiplied by 1,000. So I'll just go minus 620,600 joules. And this is going to turn out to be minus 506 times 10 to the 3. What the book got? Joules. Or if you want, minus 506 kilojoules. If the delta G is a negative number, the overall reaction is favorable. Okay? So, delta H favors the forward reaction because it's negative, it's exothermic. Even though entropy did not, it was not a big enough contributing factor. The delta H dominated numerically. It's a lot bigger number than this. Uh, and so you still got a negative delta G. And negative delta G means the forward reaction is favorable, even though entropy was not. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, what 